Good morning, everyone. It is good to see you, and it is better to be seen. <laughs> it is wonderful to be here. I'm going to find out how good Mr. Artis is. Mr. Artis, can you bring up that list laid upon you this morning on the revelation gifts, the power gifts, and the utterance gifts? And can you bring it up on the screen? Did you find it? Did you see it? You came in late. You're fired. All right. That's what I thought. All right. Well, it's up there for it to be on the screen, and now Art's looking for it. It's not my fault. That's from the people upstairs. Amen. Not upstairs, but upstairs. Hallelujah. All right. Let's go back over into our text that gives us the foundation to where we're at. And what is it? You guys are pretty smart. You are real smart. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, like the apostles. Amen. And while you're just turning over there and looking over there, I guess, Art, he's gone, so we're not going to worry about Art no more. He's, he's never here anyway. Have y'all noticed that? Yes, he is. I'll tell you what. There's an Art about him. Hallelujah. Yeah, he wants everybody to know his birthday's coming up. Make sure y'all don't forget that. Praise the Lord. Well, we've been teaching on the gifts of the Spirit for a good little while here, and we've just finished some of the utterance gifts. There's so much more than what we teach, trust me. I mean, tons more. But at least we're giving you a good general idea, and you're able to look into Scriptures and see what's going on, and all this kind of good stuff. So we uh, started with the spiritual gifts, the revelation gifts. We've already... Uh, covered three of the nine, and so in the revelation gifts, the spiritual gifts, it reveals something, and here's what they are. It's the word of wisdom, hallelujah, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. Now today we're going to play around with the word of knowledge a little bit, even though the word of wisdom's listed first. I think it'll be a little more understandable if we do it that way. And then the other three power gifts, the spiritual gifts that do something, that's the gift of faith, and the working of miracles, and always notice the way it's worded, the gifts, plural, of healings, plural. And then the last three is the utterance, the inspiration of which we've covered, prophecy, diverse kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. So anyway, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, to give a good foundation, he says, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I wouldn't have you ignorant. Look at somebody and say, he wouldn't have you be that way. I notice y'all enjoy telling each other that. I've been doing this a long time, but for some reason, that's, a, that's a, you know, God would not have you ignorant. So, and you know <laughs> that you were Gentiles, carried unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. That means to be damned. And that no man can say that Jesus is Lord. That means God. You can't say Jesus is God except by the Holy Ghost. In other words, you, you can't say that unless it's a revelation to you. You won't say it unless it's a revelation to you. I was in a meeting with Hagen. And he went up to a woman, and he was talking to the woman, and the woman was jittering in tongues, and he sensed something wasn't right. She was just, you know, da 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 Something wasn't right. And he, he said, are you born again? And she says, I've been in church a long time. And he said, say this prayer with me. And when he got to the part, Jesus is Lord, she wouldn't say it. She even told him, said, I can't. And so he cast the spirit out of her, rebuked it, laid hands on her, and led her into prayer again. And when she got to that part again, she said, Jesus is Lord. But there was something inside of her that wouldn't even let her say it. That's the way the demons are. That's the way the spirit world is. The, the power of the supernatural is so awesome that when the enemy shows up, that's the way he responds. Can I get an amen? No man says Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts. It's same spirit. There's differences of administrations. Same Lord. Differences of operations. Same. But it's the same God that works all in all. 
It says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So we've learned that it's given to all of us, and it's to profit. When people hear profit in America, they think of money. And I know that money is a sign of profiting. But did you know healing's a sign of profit? Hello. If you go work out and exercise, Bible says bodily exercise profits thee. Little. But he says little because he's comparing it to eternal spiritual. So the truth is, even in the body, exercise profits. Everything profits. Profit means you're better off today than you were yesterday. Profit doesn't mean you got a ton of money. Ecclesiastes says money answers all things. And if you don't have any questions, then you don't have any problem not having any money. Amen. I could go on into it, but just, to, just for the foundation, a couple of more verses here. For one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, same Spirit, to another faith, same Spirit, to another gifts of healing, same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, and to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues, but... All of these, they work one and self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he wills. Stop and think about it. Man, that is God's body. Your hand, your feet, your eyes, your ears. You know, it's one body. They're just doing different things. And he makes it real clear. How can I go around and just ignore my eye because it can't hear and put it down because it can't hear? All that thing can do is see. Can't hear like I can, you know? And it's funny, you're the body. Why would you want to be that way to another part? You need that part. You say, yeah, but this other part's so much greater. Yeah, but that little lesser that you don't care anything about could scratch the itch on that awesome big part. Hello. We really do need each other. And when we look at the gifts, we need to understand the gifts that are in you, I need them. They heal my body. They give me direction. They give me perfection. They, 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 they're so good for me. And they comfort. They exhort. They edify. That's all they do. Comfort, exhort, and edify. They do not beat you up, do not condemn you, and that does not criticize you. All the gifts of the Spirit to comfort, to exhort, and edify. Now, there are places in the Bible when the gifts move, some bad things happen. But the bad things that happened was because people lied cheated and stole and when they did that to the Holy Ghost it ruined their lives you can do it to me for a little while but you better not mess with God too long because he does love you but he's a little bit smarter than you and I put together can you get an amen on that one I'm pretty sure we can get an amen on that one Woo! let me flip these around got them backwards I'm getting excited because I know the body of Christ is growing and maturing and going into some things that are going to be so awesome. Amen. In Acts in chapter 9, and can you do that art? Can you bring up Acts chapter 9 verse 10? We're going to look at, at some uh, biblical examples of it and we'll just go with the flow because there's so much to do. All I can do is go until we quit and then we'll just do that. That's all I can do. Amen. There is no stopping place today. It's just go until you stop. Look at somebody and say, it's all right. I'll guarantee you. And there was a certain disciple. Notice not pastor. Notice not apostle. Notice not a great bishop. He was a disciple. That means he studies the word. At Damascus. So he's a disciple. He goes to church down at Damascus. His name was Ananias. It's funny, a lot of these people in the Bible have the name Ananias, and there's different people. And to him said the Lord in a vision, in a vision, in a vision. Hallelujah. Ananias, he said, behold, I'm here, Lord. Next verse, Art. And the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street which is called straight, inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and he hath seen in a vision 
Saul also had a light vision. A man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but in a vision, God has told Ananias here what to do. To arise and go to a street that is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas of one which is Saul of Tarsus. And he says, Behold, he prayed. There is no way he knows that man's praying. You know that and I know that. Number one, cell phones aren't but a few years old. This was 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Hello. No laptop, no telephone. Are you okay today? Okay, that's what's happening. And he come and he prayed. Ananias could not have known in the natural what was going on. He couldn't have known about that certain house. He couldn't have known about the prayer. There's no way that he could know anything about it. Saul was praying at that very minute. And while he's praying, Ananias is hearing a word and a vision from the Lord. And so he does exactly what God says. He goes there. And there's a lot can be said about this whole thing outside the word of knowledge because this is, this, this is Saul before he became Paul. Saul means destroyer. Paul means helper. Saul was on his way to Damascus to destroy another church, to capture the Christians in prison. Some of them, they even fed the lions. I mean, there's a lot of mess going on out here. And then he gets a vision to go pray for a man named Saul. Now, I know he had or has heard of Saul. I know he had to be thinking, Lord, you sure you want me to go pray for Saul? But nevertheless, with all the things that we could go into about this message, we want to see about the word of knowledge. And in this, that word of knowledge, when he... And stop and think about it. Here's Saul. He's going to destroy the church. God meets him halfway there, shines a light on him, and gives him a word. And the light's so bright it blinds him, they had to lead him away. And where they led him to, Ananias, a disciple, minding his own business, just loves the Lord. And the Lord gives him a vision and speaks to him. And now he knows what to do because he got a word of knowledge. And so he acts on the word of knowledge. He goes there, lays hands on him. Paul receives his sight. And that's the beginning. And then his name's changed to Paul. And lo and behold, he writes two-thirds of the New Testament that we call the New Testament today, part of the Bible. And here's that, uh, that Apostle Paul who once was a destroyer and who is now a helper. And he's helped so much that the revelation, Pauline revelations of who we are in Christ Jesus was granted to him. And now we know who we are in Christ Jesus because a Sanhedrin priest gave his heart to God and got born again, spirit filled, and God used him mightily and raised him up and put him in a place to say something. Can I get an amen? In Acts chapter 10, let's go to the next chapter. We'll just do one here. This is another example found in, in Acts 10. This is uh, Peter when he was in the town of Joppa. How would you like to live in Joppa? I'm glad I live in Rock Hill. So Peter went up, I'll start in verse 9. So Peter went up to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Uh, that would be noon. And he became very hungry. Must have been a teenager. And he would have eaten, but while they made ready... He was, they were fixing the food. He went in a trance. He must have been a teenager. He got so hungry they didn't feed him. He went in a trance. And he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending to him as it had been a great sheet knit with four corners. Here comes your sheet. You got four corners on it. It's coming down. Lands on earth. Verse 12, wherein were all manner or four-footed beasts on the earth. And what? and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And then a voice came to him. He said, Rise. Rise, Peter. Kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spoke again to him a second time. What God has cleansed, ribeyes and filet mignon, what God has cleansed, thou <laughs> that call not thou common. This was done thrice, three times. And the vessel was received up again into heaven. 
Now, while Peter doubted in himself what the vision which he had seen should mean, behold, take notice, look up, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry of Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which surnamed Peter, was lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, He's he's still trying, man, what was that vision? The Spirit said to him, Behold, three men seek thee. Now stop and think about it. There's three guys at a gate trying to find Peter. Peter's in a trance. He's hungry. He's all messed up. He's over here hearing from God. Nobody knows what's going on. Matter of fact, he's probably the one that wrote that song, Up on the Roof, because that's where the guy went, went up on the housetop. And so he's sitting up here, and he's chilling out. He's writing up. Up, up on the roof. <laughs> and while he's getting this vision, this is how, and then boom, look how this thing manifested, man. I mean, all of a sudden, Peter knows that he knows that he knows. There's three men waiting on me at a gate. And he responds to it. And if you just go read the rest of it, you just see how it is. Because of time, I'm going to have to throw some chapters and verses at you. And I know you'll go read it. You're readers, right? Okay, I know you will. I could give you a bunch of them, but I think sometimes when we're talking about stuff and we're doing scriptures, I think a lot of people think about, well, what about today? I'll guarantee you, Edward, Larry, Dale Stanley, quite a few of you out there, you could tell a bunch of today's stories about the word of knowledge. You know you could, but I'm up here, so I'll tell one. But I could call any of them up, and you'd be here all day listening to the stories what happened to the word of knowledge? But my wife and I, to give you one, went to a pastor's conference in Charlotte, North Carolina. Kathy, I'm assuming this would have been about 33 years ago. And we were sitting there, and must have been about maybe 75 preachers. A nice room at the Holiday Inn, and we were enjoying it. Good conference. It was about over. And we were sitting on the back. I was going through a financial, financial difficult time. It had been rough. We hadn't been paid in like nine weeks. And it was just getting tough. Ministry is a little tougher. You know, you, you keep working and sometimes you don't get paid. But it's okay to keep working. Don't worry about it. And so here we were at our ninth week. And we're like, wow, well, we haven't said anything to anybody about anything. And we were having to pay church bills so we couldn't get paid. And it was getting pretty rough. And they were getting ready to dismiss. And the guy says, wait a minute. He says, hold it. He says, uh, that man back there in the back pointed at me. I'm sitting back there with my lips poked out because I'm going through this, where's God, where's God at thing? Yeah, I know y'all have never been there. But I'd been speaking the word and standing on the word, and it seemed like 600 years had went by. Nothing was happening. I mean, it seems to be getting a little worse. So I'm at a pastor's conference sitting in the back. I don't even know what they're talking about. I'm still mad. I know y'all have never been there. But I was pretty upset. God has not showed up as I said he would. And so I'm pretty upset about this thing. Well, I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that we needed that day $1,500, bottom bottom dollar. And all of a sudden he said, man, I'm getting two figures. He said, God just spoke to me and said 1500 And he's talking about you. I was sitting back here in the back corner. And uh, then all of a sudden, he said, you, come here, pointed at my wife, left me at the back seat, brought her up there. I thought, what is he taking her up there for? And so she went up there, and he started talking to her. And he said, he said, he said I don't know what's going on in y'all's life, but I just heard a word that you need $1,500. And I heard two figures. Somebody's supposed to give a thousand, and somebody's supposed to give five hundred. He said, "I'll give the five hundred. And Phil Jackson from Grace Ministries in Charlotte, he said, "Well, I'll give the thousand." And I'm sitting back there watching my wife getting blessed. I'm the one with the big poke lip. I look like Donald Trump. I don't know what's going on around here. And so. <laughs> She's up there getting all the blessing. And then I'm back there going, we needed 1500 We were talking about it riding up here. And so the guy says, 
well, I can give you the 500 right now. And the other guy says, I have to mail you the check. I got to go to my church and mail the check. And he did. It was just a couple of days. $1,000 check was there. $500 check was there. But all those preachers were there. And he's, he says some other stuff to her. And, and then he says, oh, you're her husband. Get on up here. I thought, finally. So I go running up there. I'm thinking he's just going to pray for us. And then he says, the Spirit of God's going to speak to every one of you. And whatever he tells you to do, just do it. And I didn't know what he was going to do. He said, if, and Kathy had just told him. She said, well, this is so God because we haven't been paid in nine weeks and our church bills are this and this. And he just listened. And, and then it's when he said, y'all just do what God tells you to do. He said, but these preachers need some money in their pocket. He said, now, we know where that 1500 is going, but let's put some money in their pocket. And uh, we just stood there, and about 75 to 100 preachers just kept hugging us and touching us and putting stuff in our pockets and, and in our hands, and they got through. And when we got home, we were pulling money out of our pockets of all kinds of money, and we sat down at the table and started counting that money. My wife's sitting over here just crying. And we started counting that money. And, but it sounds great, but y'all don't know what it feels like to ride to Charlotte to a pastor's conference with your lips poked out at God <laughs> and to come home <laughs> from that pastor conference with everything you needed on your way up there. You see what I mean? And that's the way life is with God sometimes. It seems the darkest, the worst is over. You, you ought to know it's over. You can't see your hand in front of your face. But that's when the light comes on. And it is true. Amen. But Kyle could we tell? But that was a word of knowledge. That one word to give him. Call, him, call that woman out. Come on up here. God told me there's something going on about $1,500. And there's two of us supposed to meet that need. Think about it. Word of knowledge. Nobody knew anything about anything going on in our life. Our own church didn't know we weren't getting paid. No one knew anything. We didn't bother people with that stuff. We just went on with it. Is God not awesome? Oh, my goodness. If you, you, You've probably had it work in your life plenty of times. You, don't, you just didn't even know it. You get in your car and you're getting ready to go to work and it's like, did I cut that gas off? And you run back in the house and smell it. Oh, Lord, it had blown up while I was gone. All kind, it's some, it was a word. It was a, have you ever, I remember, I've told you all this a hundred times, but I never related it to a word of knowledge. Listen, me, my son and I are going deer hunting. It was, it was getting the sun coming up. We're in a hurry. We want to get in there before it gets light. It's a gravel road. It's miles long. And there's just several trailers on it way back in the woods. Early in the morning, who in the world would be in a road? And we're flying down that road. I mean flying and just zigzagging. And I saw a little blonde-headed boy in a vision standing in the road. And my car come flying up to him. And when I saw that, I just stopped. And my son said, what are you doing? Hurry up. I said, well, I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but I just seen a little blonde-headed boy in the road, and I said, and he's just around that curve, and I, I thought I was going to hit him, so I stopped. He's like, are you all right? And so I just went rolling real slow, and we went around that curve, and my headlights come up. Now, see, my son will never forget this either because he knows I can't see around that curve. It's dark. All you can see is where your headlights are aiming. And then when we went around that curve and them lights, that little blonde-headed boy made me think of Aaron Ryder when he was a little boy. It looked just like him. Blonde-haired bangs, standing out there in a little pair of shorts in the road. And when the car pulled up to him, my truck, he looked at it and just bolted off to his trailer. He just took off running. But my son looked at me and he said, now that's weird. Well, we can call it weird, but it was a word of knowledge. Because while I'm busy about my business, I don't know what's around that curve. The Spirit of the Lord does. And the Spirit of God let me see something that startled me, that forced me to stop. And if I had not, I would have went around that curve 
and I'd have been fishtailing, and if you'd have seen it the way I saw it, you would know that you know that you know. You wouldn't have time to miss this kid. You can't stop. I'd have wiped that kid out. And I don't know how y'all are, but I've always felt like if I ever did something like that, I don't think I could enjoy the rest of my life. I, I mean, really, for people that have had situations like that, pray for them, encourage them, and strengthen them, because that's just rough to accidentally, unintentionally take a little child's life. It's just going to be with you, and that's the way it is. But it's, it's the revelation of how you handle it. I better get back on subject here. Ah, let's keep going. Y'all not mad at me, are you? Can't get over it. We've done one whole page. We ain't got but five more to go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Old Testament, New Testament. Let's do one in the Old Testament here. Naaman. I know everybody's familiar with Naaman. He was healed of leprosy. And he wanted to give Elijah a bunch of stuff, and Elijah wouldn't take it. He was a good prophet. He wasn't going to take anything from him. And he just he did what God told him to do, and Naaman did what he said and Naaman got healed and now he's excited and in 2 Kings can you do that art 2 Kings chapter 5 let's see how fast and smart you are anybody that looks like Cy on Duck Dynasty ought to be smart all right I'm impressed wow only an art can do that 2 Kings 5.21. So, <laughs> Jehazi, yes, 21, followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? He said, All is well. My master sent me saying, Behold now, <laughs> even now, there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men, the sons of prophets, Give them, I pray, a talent of silver and two changes of garment. And Naaman said, be content, take two. In other words, he's so excited about his healing. He's so fired up that when Elijah's servant came back and lied to him just so he could get a little bit, then he gave the servant twice what he asked for, and he's even lying about it. I'll be content to take two talents. And he urged him. And he bound two talents of silver and two bags, two changes of garments, double what he asked for. Laid them upon two of his servants. Not only got the money, but he got people to hump it. How would you like to have so much money you need a servant to carry it? Yeah, chain him to you. Anyway, laid them upon two servants, and they bear them before him. And when he came to the tower... He took them from the hand and bestowed them in the house, and he let the men go, and they departed. Now, if we're not careful, we read and we don't hear. But he went home, and he took the stuff, and he went and put it under his bed. And then he went and told everybody, everything's okay, y'all can go home now. And so all the servants that humped the money to his house are tired, and now they're walking off. I don't even read any scripture where he gave them a glass of tea. He had to be a southerner. Amen. But like I told you, Naaman was thrilled. He was so thrilled to be healed, he gave him twice the money that he even asked for for acting like it was for others and other people. But because he was a liar and because he was a thief and because he was a hypocrite, he got exposed. He got exposed by the word of knowledge. When Elisha asked him where he had been, what did he tell him? In verse 25, he says, <clears throat> that he said, your servant went nowhere. Your servant went nowhere. How does he know? He doesn't know he wasn't there. But God told him. God showed him because when he got down, his spirit was with him. And so he saw what was happening in the realm of the spirit. It's the word of knowledge. And that word of knowledge is what came in and caused this whole thing to turn around. Turned everything around. Oh, one word of knowledge. And I said it while I'm going to say it again. The reason we could talk about it all day, some of you flow in these and you don't even realize it. You, you just don't know that's what you're doing. I, I know you have been places and done things and you've said, I've never been here before, but I'm familiar with it. It's a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom. 
and there's things that happen in your life no one ever told you and all of a sudden you just know. I was walking by a hospital room one day. I've told you all this story a bunch of times, but I never told you it was a word of knowledge. And I seen a woman standing at a window crying. And as I walked by, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and told me to go back and to pray for that woman's baby. So I went back and stood at the door and asked her, what's the matter? She said, well, they said, my baby's going to die today. They said, he's dehydrated. They can't, this can't. They went through a bunch of stuff, bunch of tubes, machines. It was crazy. Looked like he's about two or three years old. And I said, do you care if I pray for him? And she says, no. So I went and prayed for him, ministered to him. Nothing appeared to change. Nothing looked any different. And then I ministered to the woman and told her. I said, as I walked by your room, the Spirit of the Lord told me to come in here and pray for your child to be healed. She just cried and cried. She said, well, they said he'll die today. And she was all upset. So I prayed with her. I told her, I said, I'll be back. And so I come back the next day. When I come back the next day, the room was cleaned up. It's all gone. And I went and checked where, what's going on. And they said, the craziest thing happened to that kid yesterday. So we'd never seen that. said, he's been in here dehydrated. They can't figure out what's wrong. They chalked him off. They were going to let him go. He's just going to die. Said, for some reason, something happened. All of a sudden, he's eating, he's drinking. He was totally hydrated. He just, everything was great. They let him go home last night. I said, really? And she's telling me all about it. And their last name was Van Camp from Fort Mill. And even though that was so awesome and it was so wonderful, it all happened by just walking by a door and hearing a word. Pray for a child. I didn't know the child was supposed to die. I didn't know how sick the child was. I didn't know anything. I just heard a word, and when I stopped and acted on that word, that word of knowledge manifested. Now, does God not know that everybody in the whole hospital is that way? Yes, but God doesn't tell you everything. He gives you only a part. We only know in part. We move in part. Everything about God in you, for you it's a part. For him it's a whole. And you and I live in the parts. Parts are parts. <laughs> and we live in just a part. And when you get that one thing, the guy, how many times have I told you about the man sitting on a crate, a crane operator, and I didn't know him from anything. The big man, the black guy, like Johnny. And I walked right, and the Lord told me, said, tell him I'm going to take care of his marriage. Well, I don't see a wedding band. I don't see anything. There's nothing in the natural that makes me say amen. That's right on. And so I kept going. And I heard it again. Remember, if the Lord has to tell you twice, the second one's a rebuke. And so I turned around and I went back and walked right up to him. Him sitting on the crate, he was almost face level with me. I was a big man. I mean, I had a little chicken talked to him. And so I walked up to him and I said, sir, I know you're going to think I'm crazy. And you got to understand, now I'm wearing a construction hat with a big Jesus Save sticker on the front of it and denim, long hair and a beard. And I says, hey, I... I but as I walked by, the Lord spoke to me and said, tell you that your marriage is going to be okay. He's, he's going to fix your marriage. Well, he fell off the crate and hit the dirt. And I said, you okay? And he just cried. Big man, just crying. You don't know what's going on in my marriage. Next day, comes got a note in his bag. She wants everything restored. She wants everything. Fit. He's all jacked up. I don't know. I don't know who they are. I don't know what's going on in their life. I don't know anything. I'm just walking by this big man, and God so cares about him and his family and his wife that he says, go tell him I got, I got my hand on this. And I do, and he just freaks out. I'm wondering what's going on. I'm going, this is crazy the way everybody's acting. But I had no idea. I was a young Christian. I was new. I was just starting these things. Nobody was explaining anything to me. It was happening, and I was just doing it. Do y'all ever get like that? When we were about three or four weeks old in the Lord, Kathy's mother called, and she was in uh, uh, around Tampa, Florida. Indian Rocks Beach was the name of it, Clearwater. And she said they just diagnosed me with a, a, a cancerous tumor, she says, it's big as a grapefruit, and she says, it's right on my side, and it's real big, and she's just explaining it. And while she's explaining it, I said, we want to pray for you. Now, I have, I'm just getting started. I hadn't even learned to read yet. 
hey, I want to pray for you. She said, okay. So we just prayed. I just, I didn't know what to say. I just thanked God for getting rid of it and rebuked it. And I just said what little teeny bit I'd learned in a month or two. And, and that was it. Next thing I know, she's screaming and she's a hollering. I, what is it? What's the matter? She says, well, it's gone. She said, why you prayed? The whole thing just went down and left. She went back. She's completely, totally, completely, totally healed. No tumor, no any. Now, listen, I was no preacher. I couldn't, I didn't even know the Bible. I didn't know there's an Old and New Testament. I thought it was one book. I don't know anything except I once was lost, and now I'm found. And I prayed for that woman. <laughs> I mean, your own mother-in-law. I thought true happiness was a picture of your mother-in-law on a milk carton. I'm over here praying for the woman, and she gets strengthened and healed. Y'all laughing, but look at Peter. Hello, Jesus went in and prayed for his wife, and she got healed, and he denied Jesus three times. Anyway, just a little revelation for you there, something to thunk on. Let me see. Time's going so fast. Let me see if I can find something short and punchy. I've only got four minutes left. <laughs> so, I go back to 2 Kings. I'll give you the scripture about Elisha regarding Syria here. This is pretty cool. Uh, it really is. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 12. This is really, really, really awesome. It is. And I want you to go read it and see how the word of knowledge just moved in the Old Testament and how it warned the king of how the enemy wanted to come in and bring destruction to the whole place. And that one word, that one word from God came in and changed everything. And then in Acts in chapter 5, look at something in the New Testament. Uh, this one's probably not too exciting. I ought to go to another one, but I'm already here. Ananias and Sapphira, or Sapphira, uh, his wife, they sold, let's go to uh, five, chapter 5, verse 1. All right. I'm going to go ahead and start reading while Art's are searching. But a certain man named Ananias with, I, I have always had trouble with her name. I just want to call her Sapphire. But uh, <laughs> Ananias and Sapphire and his wife, they sold the possession and they kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it, kept it a secret, and bought a certain part and laid it, brought a per certain part, laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, what they're doing, just to explain, is they had already committed to sell and give. They didn't have to. They just did it because they said they wanted to. So they sold it. But what they done is they took half of the money and they brought it and laid it at the apostles' feet and they kept the other half and lied about it. Didn't even have to. They're not even in trouble. I know what you think. If you're in trouble, you still shouldn't lie. Yeah, but come on. You got to admit, trouble has provoked many a lie. All day you was honest until that cop stopped you and asked you what you was doing. It was time to lie. <laughs> I told y'all I was a sinner before I got saved. You didn't believe me, did you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But Peter said... Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? What's this? And to keep back part of the price of the land. While it remained, was it not your own? Hello. While it was in your hands, didn't it belong to you? You do anything with it you want to. And after it was sold, was it not in your own power? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Thou hast not lied to man, but to God. And to shorten it, because time's up, but he dropped dead. And the shame is, he could have just laid half down and said, here's half of the money for the land I sold. God bless y'all. Everything been fine. That was no big deal. But he wanted to give the impression that he gave it all. And he has no more. But he done hid half of it. And that caused him to just drop dead. Well, then after he dropped dead, his wife comes running in there. 
And she does the same thing that he did and told the same lie and dropped dead beside him. And then the ushers really had to go to work. They had to pick people up and carry them out. They wasn't catching. They were carrying them off. Are you hearing me? Carrying them off. So, this thing with Ananias is getting to be a very pretty serious deal. I love this. He says, while it remained, was it not your own? I think we all can learn a lot from that. Amen? Because you both, all of us know it had been all right for them to keep it, to sell it, and do anything they want with it. It's theirs. They said they were going to give it to the church. And, and stuff like that's actually happened to, to the shield. We've had people stand up and say, we have a home over at so-and-so, and we're going to sell it and give the money to the church. Tell the whole church and have us believe in it. And they would, they'd sell it and they'd give money somewhere else. Now they didn't drop dead because I didn't pray for them to die either. <laughs> I'm not that way. Amen. But these things like that happen today. and You don't see people dropping dead. But then again, when you read about it in the Word, you better know it can happen. And you don't want to be going around being an idiot. Amen. Remember, he doesn't want us ignorant. Look at the person beside you. He don't want you ignorant. That's right. Look at the other person. Say, you either. Yeah. I didn't say me. I said, you tell him. <laughs> Jeez. We're pointing at me. <laughs> anyway, they were profiting from the sale of it, and that was okay. They just didn't have to lie about it. We need to realize there's some real serious stuff going on around here. Amen? Well, time's a little bit up there. But the word of knowledge operates simply to comfort, to exhort, and to edify. And when it operates, the other things can happen at the same time. A word of wisdom can come. Discerning of spirits can be in operation. A lot of these things, they, they just intertwine with each other. All nine of them do. I mean, in tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy, you can get a word of knowledge out of any of that. A word of knowledge can come from the other gifts. A word of wisdom can come from the other gifts. But the key is, remember, it's all in part. It's not God giving any one of us everything. He gives all of us a part, just like your body. He did not make you a hand or a foot. He made you with multi-members, and that's why you do so well in your hearing and your seeing, in your speaking and your walking, in your talking and your doing. See how multiplicity you are? God has made you to do so much. And, and sometimes all we can think about is ourself. You know, let me see what's in it for me. No, I'm in this for what's in it for him. Because you become what you worship. And if you become what you worship, then I would say go to the Ten Commandments and go to the very first one. Worship the Lord thy God with all your heart, your mind, your strength, and your soul. Don't you worship any other gods and no other idols, him only. Because when you worship him, you become like, who you worship, and that is him. When you magnify him, you become more like him. When you're a giver, you're more like him. When you pray for people, you're more like him. When you're a helper, you're just like him. So the key is we say, Lord, make me more like you, and people resist it. They ask for it and resist it. I don't understand that. If you say, Lord, make me more like you, you better go read what he's like, and you can read what he's like just in the Gospel of John. Because Jesus is God incarnate in the flesh and he is showing you exactly what God would do if he was you. Are you alright? And that's what he meant to do. Come and show you exactly what to do. How to live. How to speak. How to think. How to move. How to understand. How to know where everything comes from. It's all from above. Nothing from beneath. It's all coming down. Can I get an amen? Why? So it can come out. I don't want anything coming up. I want it to come down and come out and go into the earth. Praise God. Well, I can't wait for the next service. We'll see what's going to happen. I love you guys. I hadn't seen this many people at first service in three or four weeks. Man, you guys look great today. Are you saved? Are you healed? Are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Are you delivered? Well, then y'all the people I want to pastor because now I can go fishing and not be bothered. The Lord is good.
Honey, do you have anything? I can feel it. Bring it on. Isn't she looking good? Praise the Lord. I wanted to clarify that a word of knowledge is about present situations, circumstances. A word of wisdom is about something in the future. And I perceived that uh, I need to speak to someone. You know, uh, all the psychic hotlines and the um, horoscopes and th all that is counterfeit. And if you've ever yielded yourself to that, you need to break the power of that influence and the spiritual uh, joining or the soul tie of that over your life. So if I could just do that, you know, some people get into it very innocently, uh, playing with tarot cards, Ouija boards, uh, reading books about white magic or black magic. Uh, you know, you get into it and you don't even know what you're getting into. So by the power and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, I break the powers of darkness that have attached themselves to you, either you knowing it or unknowingly. I break the influence over your mind, over your actions, over everything that you yield yourself to. And from this day forward, you will never again confer with a horoscope or a psychic or discuss psychics telling other people, you should do this, you should go here, you should... No! In Jesus' Jesus name it's counterfeit and you have something much better the Holy Spirit of God who will never lead you wrong who will never teach you erroneously and who will never deceive you so from this day forward even when you leave here today when you get in your car or if you're going to hang around for the second service you begin to denounce the things Lord when I was 12 years old and I such and such I denounce that in Jesus name and I refuse for that to have any influence over me whatsoever I will only be taught by the spirit of God the spirit of truth and I will not have any deception in my life in Jesus name while she was saying that, I actually could see an Ouija board open. And I sense very strongly the Lord saying, any of you that have anything in your homes of that nature, don't just throw it away. Burn it. There's something about burning because it, it puts it in the ash form. Okay? But just go home and pick it up and throw it in the trash. I mean fire. Just burn it up. That's the best trash can there is, a fire, a furnace. Just throw it in there and consume it. And if you got anything else you know the Lord doesn't like, you don't need the preacher to tell you. Just stack it on top of the Ouija board and chunk it in the fire with the rest of it. Amen? Yeah, man, all them playboys, all of, get rid of all of it. You can do it. Look at somebody and say, I can do it. See, I told you you could do it. <laughs> Let's all stand up on our feet. That was pretty good, Kathy. I thank you very much. You got a word of knowledge because that's a present tense situation. And uh, I got a feeling. I didn't want to embarrass anybody and say, who has an Ouija board? And say, I ain't got one. You know. But I saw it and I just know it. And it would be wonderful. I'll keep it private. But I will tell people that you did it. I just won't tell them it's you. If you just come and let me know. I chunked my Ouija board in the fire. I would just love to share that testimony with somebody. And then again, if you don't care, I'll let you share it. <laughs> if you don't care, who knows it? That's what I love about my son, Danny. He's got about as many sins, almost as many as I got. And he has gotten to the place, he'd just tell you about him, where he used to never, never, never say anything, always covered them up. And now they're all exposed. It's no big deal. He just wants things straightened out. He just wants to go right and... Thank God. Can I get an amen? I think we all can maybe identify a little bit with that. You've messed up in life and you just want everything to get straightened out so you can live like you should, honor your God, and have peace in this world. Can I get an amen? Amen. Father, I thank you for every person in this room. And I decree those of the shield are not like the regular folks around our city. I decree that they're full of the word, full of wisdom, moving in the gifts of the spirit, that they do the word according as you have spoken to them. Father, I thank you that they are disciples 
taught of the Lord, and great is their undisturbed composure. Because they are taught of the Lord. And Father, I thank you as they go out those doors, the anointing to lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, walk in newness of life, and as the righteousness of God. It's all over them, Lord, because of the power of Christ and the blood of Jesus. And I thank you for it this day. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Love you. Go do the word.